All right, if you slipped in since we began this morning again, my name is David, and it's my privilege to introduce you to our guest speaker this morning. Before I do that, let me just remind you again, we're going to be receiving the elements at the end of our time together. Pastor Mike Wolf, our missions and outreach pastor, will be leading us through that in just a little while. But before that, I'm very excited to introduce you to our guest speaker this morning. Uh, Amy and I moved here 26 years ago, and Pastor Bill, our founding pastor, would take me to events across the state of Pennsylvania and Delaware that our church is a part of, the Penn Dell Ministry Network, and he introduced me to our guest speaker this morning, Tom Reese, and his wife, Sherry, and uh, immediately, uh, Tom became a friend, he became a confidant, he became a mentor, and has been pouring into my life and to Amy and I's marriage. In fact, he came, uh, Pastor Bill had him here several years ago, and uh, he, they did a marriage event for us. And that was one of the most in, insightful breakthrough experiences for Amy and I in our own marriage. Uh, Tom serves as the director of church planting and development. And you can see his bio and uh, some information there about him inside of the app notes. So if you open up the front page of the app, go to the message notes, click on the Oakmont campus, you can go to either an English version or a Spanish version of the notes. And uh, he'll be sharing God's word with us today. And then we're going to be heading this week to a week-long series of meetings for pastors across the state up in Erie, where my wife will receive her official acknowledgement of her license uh, as an Assemblies of God minister. And... Uh, that's exciting, and Mike Wolf will be ordained during that time. So we're excited, very proud of our team. So without further delay, would you please welcome not just our director of church planting and development here in the district, but my friend, Tom. We're so glad to have you and Sherry with us. Good morning. Boy, it is great to be with you. Um, I love this church. I love this church. Uh, I love your pastor, Pastor David and Amy. Uh, pastor Bill and Teresa. Pastor Bill, are you in here? Okay. Yeah, Pastor Bill. Love Pastor Bill. Don't you love Pastor Bill and Teresa? And, uh, and you have an amazing staff and ministry leaders here. And what a great team. Let's give it up to the team. Awesome. It's awesome. Um, Pastor David, I love your heart for God. I love your gifts and just what a great leader. And, uh, and just with that, thank you so much for, uh, for your ministry here. And thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm, I'm really honored and humbled that you'd share your pulpit with me. Thank you so much. We love you and Amy. Let's give it up for Pastor David and Amy. Wow, God has given you just tremendous leaders. You know, if we lived closer, this would be our home church. Uh, it's a little hard to commute from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, but uh, it's, it's great. You know, a, a great intro, Pastor David. Um, what he didn't mention is that I moonlight a little bit on the side. It's true. Uh, our oldest daughter, Courtney, is a florist uh, in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, my wife and I, Sherry freelances for her. And when I, uh, on some of the bigger weddings, I'll help when it's needed. And uh, this summer, it's got its perks. This summer, we're going to head to Lake Como, Italy. And uh, we're going to help her with a wedding in Lake Como and then take a week afterwards in Florence. So that's got a pretty good perk, isn't it? A really good perk. Uh, however, it also has its challenges. Last summer, we were helping with a wedding in Manhattan. And... Um, it was a large wedding, I think the largest she had ever done. We had uh, two trucks that were rented to, uh, to come with a lot of the things. And 5 a.m. we started loading up. It was a morning like this morning, so not a ton of rain, but the dock was wet. And, uh, and as I'm carrying out one of the arrangements, uh, I slipped on the dock. The good news is I saved the arrangement. Isn't that a good thing? So I saved the arrangement. Uh, unfortunately, I broke my foot. And uh, yeah, here's a picture of that. You're gonna love that. It's called a Jones fracture. Uh, anybody ever had a Jones fracture? Uh, it's like the slowest healing break in the foot. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of blood flow in there. And so for like two months, I was supposed to be on um, uh, just non-weight bearing. But I'm a man. And uh, 
Yeah, poor Sherry. Thank you, Lori. We love you, Lori. Uh, and, and so initially I lived in Nile. Um, I assumed that it was just sprained. And so I sucked it up. I finished loading the box truck. I drove it into Manhattan. Uh, at the end of the day, I drove it back. Um, we had had a rehearsal dinner the night before and there was something that was left behind. So rather than take the truck all the way across, I decided it'd be a better idea to ride the bike into across the Brooklyn Bridge and back. Yeah, and so, it, in fact, here's my step count for the day, okay? Yeah, like 15,000, almost 15,000 steps on a broken foot. Um, and, uh, and, and when we got back, we began the task of unloading everything. And uh, as we were uh, putting some of the boxes in the dumpster, it wasn't all fitting. So somebody had to jump in and stomp the boxes down. And guess who it was? It was the man in denial. And so uh, I was definitely in denial. And then uh, a couple of days later, Sherry and... And my girls just uh, did an intervention and uh, said, you know, you really should get this looked at. I said, it's just a sprain. And, uh, and so uh, that's when I found out it wasn't a sprain, but it was a broken foot, non-weight bearing. Let me ask you this. Has there been a time in your life when you've lived in denial? I think we all have. And, uh, and so today, uh, we're going to look at Romans chapter 3. And Paul's writing to some people that have been living in denial. And the Apostle Paul does an intervention. Uh, he speaks truth into the spiritual condition of not only the Jews and the Gentiles of that time, but it's relevant to us nearly 2,000 years later. Uh, when Paul's spiritual x-ray, what it reveals is that no one is righteous. No one is righteous. In that verse, verse 10, uh, the diagnosis, no one is righteous. There is none righteous, not even one. Not even one. And so the chapter begins, and, uh, and, and as the chapter begins, it starts talking about, there's like a, a, a dialogue that goes on where Paul's having a dialogue as to what a Jewish objector would say to what he's written about in the previous two chapters. And so the objection would be, but I'm Jewish. I'm God's chosen people. What advantage does that have for me? And for us 2,000 years later, we might say, well, I'm, I'm, I go to church. Uh, I went to the Brandon Lake concert. Uh, you know, so, you know, as a result of that, does that make me a Christian? Does that make me, in this case, does this give me free access to heaven? And he opens chapter 3 with stating that the advantage of a Jewish heritage, and for us today, the advantage of a Christian heritage is not that it makes us righteous, not that it made them righteous, but rather that they've been entrusted and we've been entrusted with God's word. And so what he does in this chapter is he said that this is foundational for understanding what God says about our spiritual condition. And then he goes on and Paul quotes from Isaiah, from the Psalms, from Ecclesiastes, different verses. And so as he walks through that, it's really interesting. I remember being at a McDonald's uh, a couple of years ago, and Shannon did a great job uh, putting all the stuff in the app. But if you look at my bio, when I mention that I'm a Philly sports fan, she puts next to it in parentheses, boo. So, <laughs> boo. But uh, I, I know you're all excited to see how Kenny Pickett does on the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, <laughs> And somebody told me, well, he's your headache now. But, uh, but with that, uh, I'm having a conversation with a guy. We, it was during the Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl, the last Super Bowl run. And, uh, and he was wearing his gear, and, and I went up and just struck up a conversation. And, uh, and we started talking about faith. And I asked him, you know, just in terms of a little bit about, you know, his background and, and, and his faith. And, and it was really interesting. He said, Jesus, I like. Paul, I don't like. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Why? Because with Jesus, you know, the response, he can pick and choose, by the way. I don't think he really knows Jesus either because Jesus lays things out. But he likes some of the stories of Jesus. But when you deal with the writings of Paul, Paul's pretty much a strong truth teller. He tells it like it is here. And he helps us to recognize our spiritual condition without Christ. 
There is none righteous, no, not one. And so he lays it out with verses from the Old Testament that the Jewish believers should already know. And, and, one, and so as we look at it today, I want us to ask ourselves the question, do we fall short in these areas? The first part is, do we fall short in our character? And here's the scripture there. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've be, they have together become worthless. In, in other words, you know, with this, you know, they're not really seeking God. So it's, it's not of great worth because of the fact that we've kind of separated ourselves from God. There is no one who does good, not even one. And, uh, and that's really interesting. You go through and you look at this, and I'm like looking at the part, no one who seeks God, really no one who seeks God. But then I'm realizing this is, this is a big G. This is that seeks the true God. Ray Steadman writes this. He says, now men look for a God all the time. And you go, well, is that a contradiction? No, because the God that we look for isn't really the true God. This is the entire drive of religion around the world, to find a God that man can worship because man cannot live without a God and every man has his God, but small g. We see people come on Sunday mornings polishing and waxing them at times, waxing and polishing their God, taking them on trailers down to the water's edge and so on. There's a lot of gods, all kinds of them, many different varieties, and every man has his own God. Can you think about before you found the true living God, what was your God? What was your God? What were you putting your trust into? but we fall short in our character. We also fall short in our words. And so do you fall short in your words? Look at these verses. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. It's crazy the day and age we live in right now. I was watching a pastor or a preacher the other day preaching and he's swearing and I'm scratching and I'm like, what Bible are you reading? And so when I think about that, I mean, just it's, it's, it's some of the values of the world have trickled into even our communication as believers. God, help us, change us. I remember when I first got saved, I, I remember I was driving on the way to, you know, just on the way to church, somebody pulled in front of me and I swore at him. And I was just like, oh. and then I got this big fear and I'm thinking, oh no they're going to follow me into church. <laughs> oh, I, I just remember, man, going to the altar and saying, oh, God, change my mouth. And uh, do you fall short in your actions? Look at these verses. And, and going on, he says, their feet, these are Old Testament scriptures. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery marks their ways. And the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And, and I think about this, this talks about, I mean, we fail God from, from head to toe, from our eyes to our feet, we fail God. And, and I thought when I looked at it, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't shed blood. I'm not a murderer, but Jesus talked about that. And he said, boy, you know, if, if you've got something against somebody and, and, and in, terms, in terms of how you respond to them, it's just, uh, I think we live in this day and age where we think that uh, th this is what Jesus says. He says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. He goes on to say this a little later, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm thinking because I haven't killed anybody, I'm in good shape. But he talks about the attitude of the heart and also what we communicate in that. Uh, do we fall short of God's law? And you go, boy, this is a real pick-me-up message, Pastor David. I'm so glad you picked the book of Romans. Uh, and I'm so glad I agreed to stay with the series. But... Uh, <laughs> But, but let me just tell you, you've got to get the diagnosis to be able to get the cure. You know what I'm saying? You've got to understand your condition. My foot couldn't get better until I realized my problem and realized I had to do better with following 
the treatment plan. And so with this, you fall short of God's law. In verse 15, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. The law is not the way of salvation. The law helps us to see we need salvation. It makes us accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And you say, what's the law? I mean, you read through the Old Testament, and there's a lot of law there. And a lot of people love skipping all that because they just want to get to the good parts, uh, you know, when Jesus comes. But, but the law is so important to us. The Ten Commandments. Let me ask you this. Which Ten Commandments have you broken? Okay, and what we're going to do is I'm going to read a commandment. If that's you, would you raise your hands real high? <laughs> Pastor Bill says, please don't do that. Uh, so, uh, you know, with that, but mentally take note. You shall have no other gods before me. Have you had other gods before him? Uh, I had a neighbor that, man, their god was their lawn. <laughs> And let me just tell you, I helped break that in their spirit when my dandelions would pop up. I knew. Anyway, but uh, um, you shall make no, uh, you shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. How are you doing with those five? Here's five more. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And did I just do that by talk? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> and you shall not covet. And you shall not covet. The law. It helps us to see what our condition is. But with this, it moves on in verse 20. And we talk about placing your faith in Christ and he'll give you the gift of righteousness because we can't be righteous in our own. We need his gift to make us righteous. Here's the good news. But now this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad for that? Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your gift. Lord, I love you. Thank you for your gift and for redeeming us. But here's my story. Uh, I started this morning by talking about how my foot was broken. But long ago before my foot was broken, my family was broken. Uh, here's my story. Uh, West Philadelphia, born and raised. Um, while in high school, I remember doing a suicide watch on my mom. She was broken. Uh, my family tree is a family shrub. Uh, I've had three dads in my life. Dad number one, it was divorce. It was a broken marriage. Uh, dad number two, um, he was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. I remember Saturday morning watching cartoons and there's the knock on the door and, and I answer the door and there's a soldier there and I go back and he asks for my mom. I tell my mom there's a soldier there. He's dressed like daddy. She just begins crying, uh, broken in grief. His helicopter was shot down and he was killed. I shared my testimony at uh, Todd and Tina Pugh's church. And I had uh, one of the gentlemen came up and uh, he said to me, and I'll never forget this, and he just said, uh, what year, what was the date? And I told him, and he told me that during that time frame, he had actually, I think he had just left right before my dad. He said his job was to go and pick up the remains from the helicopter pilots. What do you do when you have to pick up the remains from a broken heart, from grief? How do you handle that? What do you do with that? Dad number three, my mom's heart was broken through deception, uh, broken in despair. We found out that dad number three, he was an attorney for a major oil company. And one week a month, he would go to Texas. He had a mistress in Texas. We found out also that when he was on the weekends and, and, and supposedly had things, he had a family he was going to on the weekends. 
you know, I don't know about you, keeping one woman happy is a full-time job, let alone three. And so, and my wife is, she's amazing. So, uh, and, and, but with that, I'm thinking about what do you do when you have this? When that happened, I just, you know, I, I'm so concerned. What, what's going to happen to my mom? And I couldn't let her out of my sight. But what do you do? We called Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe was a bag man for the mafia. And, uh, yeah, this story keeps getting better and better, doesn't it? Uh, so he pulls up in his black Cadillac. My little Italian mom gets in the front seat. I get in the back, and we drive to Downingtown, Pennsylvania, because that's where he was with his weekend family. And as we drive through the development, because here's the deal. When you're in sin, you don't want anybody to blow your cover. And so uh, we drive through the neighborhood because we're going to blow his cover. We're going to just lay it all out there to her. And, uh, and he sees us in the, in the, he's in his driveway, he sees us and he panics and he's like, not here. And he tells us to follow him. So he gets in his T-Bird and drives around. We follow him, get into a parking lot, pull into a parking lot. He gets out of his car. My uncle's getting out of mine. I said to my uncle, Uncle Joe, be careful. Dad number three knows karate. <laughs> my uncle pops open the trunk and grabs a crowbar. That my uncle knows crowbars. And, uh, and, and so with this, uh, you know, uh, big arguments ensuing in the parking lot and uh, all the things we talked about in terms of words were flying. And, uh, and we get to the point where my mom sees that, that this, is, this is not good. She throws her arms around my uncle and says, Joe, let him go. And my uncle restrains himself and dad number three drives off and I don't see him for years. What do you do? When your whole life is caved in, what do you do? In God's sovereignty, we were in the parking lot of a church. My mom said, I'll be back. She walked into that church. She talked to somebody 10, 15 minutes. It wasn't like long. She shared a little bit about what she was going to. And that person said that this is toxic. What you've experienced, this is toxic to your spirit. You've got to give it to Jesus. And that day, my mom gave it to God. I, I remember we were driving back on the turnpike and she had my uncle pull over and she looks at my uncle and she said, Joe, I feel something different. That, my, that day, my mom went all in with Jesus. She experienced his forgiveness and his salvation. And uh, she cried out to God, his grace, forgiveness, salvation was there. And uh, amen. When my mom came to faith, she shared with me and, uh, and told me that I needed that too. And I said, Mom, I'm good. I'm good. Isn't that an expression we use all the time? Somebody talks to us, oh, I'm good. I'm good. And so this whole thing, I'm good. And, uh, and, and so, you know, my mom, she worked in a club. And during that time, it was the go-go boots and the whole bit. I'm like, Mom, you really needed to. I was the church acolyte in a mainline church. I was the guy that lit the candles and, and, uh, and I'm good. She talked about being born again. I said, mom, you need to be born again. I, I've been born pretty good the first time, you know? Uh -huh. So back in those days, and I have to kind of, I recognize I was talking to somebody earlier and, uh, and they said, I don't even know who Billy Graham is. How many of you know who Billy Graham is? Okay, those are all the older people in the church. Uh, so Billy Graham, like an evangelist, traveled around the world and, and they would televise his crusades. I mean, stadiums would be full and he'd give an invitation to receive Christ. And, and so uh, I'm playing stickball down the street. So remember, I'm in high school, I'm playing stickball with my friends and, and mom would open up the screen door and say, Tommy, it's time to come in and watch Billy Graham. That went over really well with, with the guys. And I remember one of them went across street kenny he would put the like stickball bat which is basically a broom handle on his shoulders say hey tom worship me i'm jesus i'm like knock it off guys and i'd go in and i'd watch billy graham and he'd build this whole case about you know the jesus and giving your life to jesus and and then he'd invite and they'd play this song you know just as i am and 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 they'd get ready to pray the prayer and he you know invite the people in the stadium to come down and he'd say if you're watching on tv you can kneel right in front of your television set and i'd go down i'd kneel in front of the television set and I'd say the prayer, and I'd say the prayer. And, uh, and after I said the prayer, my mom would look at me and say, okay, did you feel anything? 
I said, nope, didn't feel anything. She said, okay, we'll try again tomorrow night. Okay. <laughs> we went through that all week long, but I didn't feel anything. When she got saved, it was extremely emotional. She felt it. Well, a couple months later, I'm on the way to high school, and I'm on, a, I'm on the Broad Street subway. And, uh, and I'm kind of bored, and somebody had given some gospel tracts some literature that talked about God. And I, and, I, and I pulled one up and it talked about that uh, feelings follow faith. And it actually had this graphic. Take a look at this graphic. And, um, and with it, it's really interesting because it, a lot of times in a lot of people's life, the feeling drives their relationship with Christ. Think about it. Marriages are like this too, by the way. Well, I don't feel like I love you anymore. And so with that, the feeling, but the feeling is the caboose. What's the fact? Here's the fact. The fact is that God loves you. The fact is that we've sinned. The fact is that Jesus rose from the dead. He died for our sins and he rose from the dead. That's fact. And with that, we can come to a place where we believe it and in faith we believe it. And so with this, I love this verse in verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. By faith, we receive what God has done for us. I talked about two tracks. The, the other track, the other piece of literature that I had was do good works save. Remember, I'm good, I'm good. See, we live in a world where we compare ourselves to other people. You know what I'm saying? And so with that, um, if I asked you and I said, okay, so who do you think? And I ask people in the world, let's say I'm asking people out there and I'm saying, you think of all the people that have done good, all the people that have done good in the world, who do you think has done the most good? And you know, one of the number one answers to that, one of the number one answers to that, climbing the ladder to God Climb in the ladder, and you say, Tom, don't break your foot, okay? Climb in the ladder to God is Mother Teresa. People say, oh, Mother Teresa, I mean, she, she served people in Calcutta. She did a lot of good works. She did. And, but at the same time, Mother Teresa will tell you that those, don't go, those good works don't get her to heaven. It only goes so, it doesn't, it doesn't get us there. We fall short. Mother Teresa fell short. You ask evangelicals and they'll go, well, Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Man, he, he won all kinds of people to the Lord. And some of you go, well, I don't like the fact that you put Billy Graham ahead of Mother Teresa. Okay. You know, I mean, just with that, I'm just telling you how people think. You know what I'm saying? So we can switch it out and go the other route. But for now, well, just for the illustration, we got that there. Are you okay? The Velcro is not coming off. Right. So are we good? We good? Okay. Um, so you look at that and go, well, Tom, you know, who else do you have? Well, okay. How about the founding pastor of this church? <laughs> Bill Ellis. Okay. Some of you aren't happy that I put Bill Ellis behind Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. It's okay. Deal with it. Deal with it. Okay. And you say, well, who else you got on this list? Who else you got on this list? Okay. David Kennard. <laughs> okay. So David Kennard. So I've got David Kennard on here. Some of you aren't happy that I put David behind Bill. Bill's the founding pastor. Are you okay with that? You all right with that? That's good. Okay. So, hey, where do I put myself? I'm all the way down here. Okay. Maybe not even on the ladder. But here's the bottom line. Where do you put yourself? Where do you put yourself? And you go, well, I'm going to put myself probably right ahead of... Where are you going to put it? Here's the bottom line. All fall short. All fall short. If I want to get to heaven, it's not going to be because I climb a ladder of good works. It's because of God's grace. And so when we look at this and we navigate this, and some of you look at the ladder and go, well, boy, I put Pastor Lori, I put when Lori was, you know, I put her up here. No, no, we're not. We all recognize where we fall. 
we fall short. We fall short. So this whole thing, that day, all those times I knelt in front of the TV and worked, it didn't click. Today I'm praying that this clicks with somebody. That today that the blinders are lifted and you go, I get it. I get it. So on that train, I came to this place where I said, my good works, I fall short of God because of my sin. I can't climb my way through doing good to get there. I need God's grace in my life. And so when I look at this, let me just say that on that train, I prayed a prayer. They actually wrote it down in the track. And I looked at it and I said, do I believe this? So here's a prayer of salvation. And so with that, I'm going to invite you to pray with me a prayer of salvation today. And it's not the magic of the words. It's the faith to say, do I believe this? Do I trust God with my life? Because we all fall short, we need his grace. So today, it's not because of your actions. It's not because of my actions. It's because of his actions. And we're placing our life in his hands. Would you bow your heads? And as we pray this prayer, could you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner and I've fallen short in so many ways. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord from this day forward. Guide my life and help me to walk in your righteousness. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, if you meant it in your heart, if you made that decision today, if you made that decision and said, God, I'm giving you my life. For some of us, we've made that decision long ago, but day by day, we renew that commitment with Christ. And with this, we're gonna, we're gonna go to the Lord in communion. And I love this verse in verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice for atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Normally what we do in church settings is this. When it comes to communion, we say we're about to receive communion together. And, and if you do not know Jesus, don't take communion. And, and I understand that, but I'm telling you, Jesus is inviting you to his table. He's inviting you to this table. And so with that faith in Christ, we come to that table and we say, God, we place our lives before you. We fall short, but we receive your grace. And today with that, in faith, we come together as the body of Christ and receive this. Let's prepare our hearts for communion. If you would take out your elements and prepare those. Thank you. I don't want you to rush through this. Um, Tom says we all fall short and Christ says we all fall short and we all know that we all fall short. Um, and we need to admit that. And in this moment of silence, I, I want you to think about where you fall short. And also give your thanks.
to Jesus for what he's done for us, the ability to do this, the ability that he gave us when he atoned for all of our sins. Should you prepare your elements? And we will do the bread first. The bread that represents his broken body. The broken body that he did for us. And in Luke 22, 19, 20, it says he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. At this time, let us take the bread. As they went through the meal, he raised his glass. And the glass of wine represents his blood. The blood that was poured out for us. Literally poured out for us. And it represents his new covenant. Jesus' new covenant with the world. So as we take the, the juice, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Let us take the juice. I pray that during your moment of silence, at least one thing came to mind. You know, we talked about Mother Teresa up there. One of the things that she always talked about when she gave interviews was she did not talk much to God. She just listened. And she knows that he listened to her. And God is listening to you in this place right now. He's listening to Maybe your fears, or you're broken, or you've sinned, but no sin is too great for our God. So I pray that some action this week um, will start to adjust those things. So let me pray. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us, the words you've given us, the grace and mercy and love that is a great mystery because we cannot understand it. It goes beyond all understanding and we shouldn't try to understand it, but we have faith in it. Father, I pray for everyone here that they address whatever issues are keeping them apart from you. They address whatever fears they have whatever shortcomings they fear. Father, for we know that you have greater things for us planned than we could ever possibly imagine. And we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. At this point, uh, please stand for finishing worship.
Thank you so much, Tom, for helping us to continue this series. We're so glad to have you and Sherry with us today. I appreciate the word so much. For those of you that are wondering, what do I do with what I've just experienced, what I've just heard? Perhaps if you've prayed that prayer for the very first time or first time in a long time, we want to help you. That's why I remember what I said at the beginning. We're here to help you to find and follow Jesus. And there are resources down here around the front. We'd love to put a Bible into your hands if you don't have one. Uh, let me just mention as well, we're beginning our next Bible reading plan in the Version Bible app. All the links are there. We're continuing with part two of this series of Romans, so you can join us and read on digitally with everyone else. But if you don't have a paper Bible, we'd love to put one in your hands. There's a resource entitled, He Did This Just For You, and it describes the lengths that Jesus went through so that we don't have to climb the ladder any longer. In fact, let me just mention real quickly, I couldn't help but think, I wonder how many of you, if, if I was here for the first time or I was coming in and I saw a ladder up on a stage like this on a Sunday morning, I'd be thinking, do they not know it's there? How tacky is this? How do they not realize this? Well, look for God to show up in ways where it looks like there's something out of place. And let that remind you, I don't have to climb the ladder any longer. So he did this just for you, begins to help you to grasp a hold of that. The other one is entitled First Steps, Learning to Follow Jesus. And there's information in there about how we can help you one-on-one, -on -one, spiritually coaching you discipleship, guys with guys, ladies with ladies, and there's information in there, and we'd love for you to take any of those with you, and I'll be down here around the front, love to have a conversation with you afterwards to help you to take some next steps. We would really appreciate it, and that'd be an honor for us to get to do that. As you're leaving, you'll see that there are buckets on your ways out. You can drop your what you came to give today, your tithes to return and your offerings to give. You can give through text to give, digitally, online, any of those ways. Thank you for your faithfulness. When you're giving today, we tell you this often, you're investing in things like kids ministry, student ministry, young adult ministry, missions and outreach. Recently, we had a worship night and it was such a fantastic night. This place was full and it was a wonderful evening just being able to worship God and celebrate what God is doing in our midst as a church. And so when you're giving, just keep in mind today, those are all the things that you're investing in. It's so much bigger than what we could even see. Such an honor to be able to return those things to the Lord. And one last thing, because mama always said, clean up after yourself, take your communion elements and all of those things with you as you leave today so we can be ready for the next service. Father, thank you so much for all that you have in store for us. Thank you for what you've spoken over us today and in our hearts and lives. And Lord, I do pray for all of us that that awareness that we've fallen short would not result in condemnation, but that would result in a spirit and a heart of overflowing gratitude for what you've done, Jesus, in the cross and in the resurrection. Thank you for the freedom of being able to live in a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray for those that are asking questions, those that perhaps very for the first time prayed that prayer today, God, that they would begin to sense that there's a change that's happening from the inside out, that there would be an opportunity for them to step into the new, a new life in you, Jesus. Thank you for everyone that uh, gives today and for the, what's given, Lord. We pray that you would bless it and multiply it and use it to continue to help students, kids, young adults and adults here in this area and around the world find and follow you. It's in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we pray together. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. Pastor Jay will be back next week to preach our next message in the series.